the Y'all Show, Talk With a Southern Accent. How y'all doing? We're getting another week of Talk About the South up and going. And when we reach this special spot of the show covering everything Dixie, we bring on the guy that knows a whole lot about this part of the world, Jerry Short. He is the Takapola storyteller. And Jerry is on with us right now to let us know what is going on in his part of the South. Jerry, thank you, and welcome back to Y'all Talk With Us Southern Accent. How's it going, John? Good to hear you. Got you in a studio set up today. I yeah, like it. I thought I'd drive by and, uh, since I was in town and see how the upper class live. <laughs> I like it. I like it. The upper class, well, let's be honest, the upper class, we're not doing too good these days, but that's okay. That's a whole other story. But we're glad to have you aboard. Jerry and I are excited that the summer is here. We're excited that maybe you are also having a great summer start. And Jerry, I was hanging out with you and we were driving around and we were going to eat catfish and having dessert here lately. And I had you talk about something or you brought up something to my attention that unfortunately for those young folks like me, this is not all that common these days. Back in the days of the Takapola Storyteller's youth, there was something called a purple cow. Could you tell us about some memories of what that is and what the heck that is? Well, you know, they've got a commercial on television these days, and they show a cow that's purple. And I don't think anyone actually knows the origin of why you say purple cow. But when I was a kid, it was like a, Ice cream probably originated in drugstores. And most drugstores had a soda fountain. And a soda fountain, you could come up and you could order, you know, a banana split. Boy, that sounds good. Or you could order uh, some kind of, car- I like to just drink carbonated water. Made me think I was a big shot sometimes. But they had another thing that uh, I liked that you could call, they called it a, cur- a purple, purple cow. And I bet they had a lot of those in Louisiana and around LSU, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I didn't know at the time, didn't think about it. But uh, a purple cow, do you remember a knee-high grape? I do. You do remember that? I remember it, but I don't <laughs> necessarily have the authority here on today's y'all show to tell you that I grew up enjoying the knee-high grape yeah. beverage because, honestly, I think it faded out at some point in our southern yeah. history. You know, we had knee high oranges and grapes and peaches and all those kind. Of, it was kind of a brand like Coke or Pepsi or so. But anyway, uh, you could belly up to the bar in a belly up to the bar in a in a soda jerk fountain and order a purple cow. Now then, what do you think purple cow consisted of? Uh, that's a good temper. question. I think they put a little carbonated water in it. I'm not real sure. But uh, it was vanilla ice cream, which, you know, heck, boy, that's hard to beat anywhere. Put vanilla ice cream and a knee-high grape, which color is purple when it mixes with that vanilla ice cream. And uh, we call that a purple cow. So I would belly up and say, Hey, give me one of those purple cows. I believe I could use one today. And it might be as hot as it, uh, back an August day. Hey, a purple cow went pretty doggone good. So, uh, that's when, that's the reason I brought it up to you because I wondered if you had seen the commercial where they got a cow purple and they leave it around and they talk about a purple cow. That's got to be where they came up with the terminology purple cow. So, uh, for those of y'all who lived in those days and and might have enjoyed a purple cow, hey, think back about it. Wouldn't be bad to start over again and have a few more purple cows, right? There you are longing for the old days, Jerry. I can't help myself, you know. When you get my age, you got to look back. You know, it's not a lot of forwards to look out there for. And uh, the way some of the things are going right now, Oh, it's questionable how much forward's out there. But uh, anyway, that was some of the uh, reminiscing that uh, I was throwing your way while we were riding around a little bit today. 
Well, let's go through a little soft drink history with you, Jerry, since we did bring up knee high. Knee high, and it was pronounced just like I said, knee as in like the thing on the part of your legs, knee high, but not spelled that way, spelled N-E-H-I. I wonder how in the world they got that name. I don't it know was how introduced- they spelled it for me, but I forgot it, it- Introduced in 1924 by Shiro Cola Union Bottle Works, the Nihai Corporation name was adopted in 1928 after the Nihai fruit-flavored sodas became popular in 1955. In, in that year, the company changed its name to Royal Crown Cola, a Royal Crown Company, after the success of its RC Cola Brown. Nihai was founded by Claude A. Hatcher, a Columbus, Georgia grocer, who began bottling ginger ale and root beer in 1905. In April 2008, Nehi became a brand of Dr. Pepper Snapple Group, now known as Keurig Dr. Pepper in the United States. So it looks like you can still find Nehi. It's not quite as common as Coke or Pepsi, no. but it looks like it's still out there, and I you can still I've get you a purple one. cow. Yeah, I think I've seen one. Now you've got my interest up. And uh, I may look at every service station on my way home tonight, see if I can find a purple uh, knee Yeah. But, uh, they're hard to find, I think. But, well, how uh, about Columbus, Georgia coming back through in the soft drink annals of our history? Because it was in Columbus, Georgia, that a doctor there decided to, uh, maybe even a pharmacist, in the years after the Civil War, of which he was wounded on a bridge there in Columbus, Georgia, and he helped start something called Coca-Cola. That's right. And I think uh, I think Coke actually had its name involved in its uh, mixture then. Coke. Yeah. Cola. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think so. And I, I think they had to back off of it a little bit. I believe so. And, uh, you know, the first one ever bottled was in Vicksburg. And, Vicksburg, uh, Mississippi. Mississippi. And it was a pharmacist. You know, they seemed to always get into these things, but I think they were delivering medicine across the uh, Mississippi River and other items into Louisiana. And to make people have that, uh, that uh, spurge that it gives you, you know, when you shake it up a little bit. Yeah. And uh, they, they decided to put it in a bottle and put a cap on it. And that would hold it that way. So they carried it over into Louisiana. And far, it used to be a museum in Vicksburg, and it burned. But I've been to it when it was still there. And uh, they uh, built their self at first place to bottle the Coca-Cola, which is pretty interesting. you know. And they had a lot of, a lot of souvenirs in that place. I've got a five-cent Coke. Uh, well, actually, I uh, let my daughter have it, I guess, at her house. But I bought a five-cent Coke machine and it was a one with a crank on the side and it was a six ouncer and it was a it, it had kind of a fan rotisserie type deal that rolled around and you would handle that crank bar and push it down and then later the coke was a nickel in so all it did had a slot for a nickel but then later it became six cents and they screwed an honor box on the side of it. And you'd drop a penny in it. But that was up to you being honest. It wouldn't work without the Coke, without the nickel. But you could go ahead and get your Coke. But to be honest, you put the penny in the drop box that was screwed on the side hmm. of the machine. And I've got one of those. Yeah. For my daughter does. Talking with our Takapola storyteller, Jerry Short. This is y'all talk with a Southern accent. We always reach into a basket of unknowns when we have Jerry Short on the show. And today we're starting off talking about purple cows and soft drinks. By the way, the founder of Coca-Cola, John Pemberton. I knew the last name was Pemberton. I wasn't totally sure of his first name. And it's a pretty good first name to have, John. And he started Coca-Cola. He passed away in the 1880s. Probably had no idea his invention would end up being a amazing company that has been all over the world here of late. Uh, but yeah, we've had a lot of soft drinks here created in the Southeast. In fact, Jerry, I happen to have sources telling me if you reach over, we'll go ahead today on the y'all show and do a first, our first live sip 
on the Y'all Show. I do believe within an arm's distance of you, you've got another Southern-based soft drink that you Is can take a sip Southern of. Right yeah, Waco, Texas. Mm. Dr. Pepper. Mm. Not bad, Waco. <laughs> you know? And, you, uh, you approve of Dr. Pepper, it looks like. Oh, yeah. There was a, also a, a drink uh, that was uh, first made and discovered in Greenville, Mississippi. Dr. Pepper? No, that would be uh, Barks Root Beer. Oh, Greenville or <laughs> Biloxi? <clears throat> they sold out to New Orleans, I think. I see. Yeah, and it went to New Orleans. But I think that's where, I, I think they still make it, don't they? A bark yeah, they, beer? they they bottle it and on the Mississippi Gulf Coast you can find bark fruit beer and it is the reason it is a little bit hard to find in a bottle because the comp the family sold it to Coca Cola many years ago and Coke still puts bark fruit beer out in cans and plastic bottles but as part of the sale they reserve the right the family that was to still continue to bottle it and it's available yeah. on the Mississippi yeah. Gulf Coast. In fact, That's there was. There was a fella about five or six years ago that went around the southeast with another fella, and he had a whole cooler full of Barks root beer on ice, and he would go by radio stations and, as a nice little happy, give them a nice ice-cold Barks root beer. Hey, that's, that's history and making right there. It was history, <clears throat> and, and I think he didn't you know who that was. That was, that was me, and that was my co-traveler uh, there was Jerry Short, who now has got off the road and now is in studio with us here talking about all things Southern. So yeah, we've got the purple cows of the world that people can enjoy this time of year. And that's wonderful. If you can find you a knee high, I'll tell you, Jerry, we, we kind of know here based on what we are learning from you today, that you are partial to Dr. Pepper. One of the amazing things that has happened in my adult life is a, recreation of a favorite part of my childhood something that was taken away from me jerry came back yeah. and that doesn't happen all that often in today's world but one of my favorite things as a kid was my family they were farmers and right. one of the only perks you got as a kid working on our family farm was you got to go outside the packing shed and we had a a, a coke machine or it really it was actually a Pepsi machine, yeah. but we had all kinds of soft drinks in that <laughs> thing. And, and, uh, one of my perks was not the fact that I got free drinks. I actually, I didn't, but I usually could find 50 cents somewhere to pay for the Coke bottled <laughs> Coke. Was, that was, you paid 50. Uh, Ooh. it might've been 25 cents. It was, it was, <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, it was a long time ago, but yeah, we <laughs> had that going on and, one of the real perks of my childhood was we had Fanta in a bottle in that in that machine, and I don't know if you remember anything about the old Fanta bottles. I believe that was a uh, uh, wasn't that a diet drink. No, nah, it was a purple drink, just like knee high. Oh, okay, I don't remember. But, but if you could ever get your name? yeah Fanta, Fanta was a drink that Coca Cola put out a long time ago, and in the days that they bottled Fanta, their bottles were so awesome to hold. They had a, a ridge, little cutout ridges yeah. along them. And when you grab that, when a, when a bottle was cold or right out of ice, it just felt good in your hand. And yeah. so I love the taste of an ice cold Fanta grape is what we had growing up. And Fanta disappeared. Fanta went away, at least most places in the South, at least stopped having Fanta somewhere in the 1990s. And yeah. it wasn't until the South had, and, and America had had a, let's just use the word invasion from the South. So many people in South America or Central America crossing the border and coming to live here in America, Fanta never went away in places like Mexico or right. Nicaragua. And so those people love Fanta, grape and orange. And so when there were so many people that were Latino that had moved in here, the Coca-Cola company decided to, hey, you know what? Let's reintroduce Fanta. And so you can find Fanta now all over the place, especially in, in bottles and, and, and not bottles, in cans and 20 ounce bottles in grocery stores and, and convenience stores. I still haven't seen a Fanta bottled 
at this point, but it, it's only because of the influx of Latinos coming to this part of the world is why we have Fanta drinks now available t- for purchase. Yeah, well, I didn't know that. I know Coke put a diet drink out the first one, and uh, it was awful because I think my mother tried those things. Are you talking about but tab? I, that's it. Yeah, the tab. Wasn't it a bottle similar to the one you just described? It probably was. I think it was. And there's one, I hitchhiked over to Birmingham when I was about 14, and Cokes were a nickel. And I figured I had uh, eh, maybe 10 Cokes or five Cokes and five uh, cookies or something to buy for that 10 cents because everything was a nickel. So that would have been about 1960. And I got to Birmingham to the railroad yards, and I went down there, and they had, these drinks, but I looked through them and I had a nickel left. And I, I one of them was called had an Indian head uh, on the on the outside of the bottle, and he had a war bonnet in there. I think he had a war bonnet. But anyway, I looked at it and I said, and the name of it was Buffalo Rock. Mm. And I said, that's one I want with this nickel. That was the worst drink I ever put in my mouth. I don't think I finished it, <laughs> and I was needing a drink mighty bad. But, you know, I think they may still bottle a Buffalo Rock in the Birmingham area. The name of the distribution company up there for either Pepsi, Cola, or Coke, and I think it's Pepsi, is Buffalo Rock. Oh, really? So you'll see trucks running around central Alabama, Buffalo Rock, but it's not necessarily because of the drink. It's the name of their company. Well, they once had a drink called a Buffalo Rock, uh-huh. and I can understand why it didn't last. <laughs> because it got my last nickel, and I didn't get all uh 16 ounces of it, I'll put it that way. Well, the only kind of part of it. The mm. Central Alabama beverage lovers may not have Buffalo Rock these days, but I'll tell you what, there's another drink coming out of that part of the world that's spreading like wildfire. It's called Milo's Tea. In fact, they have a new factory yep. that's massive in Oklahoma, of all places. So, way to go there from Milo's out of Birmingham. We're not done with Jerry Short. We actually have some serious stuff to talk about besides soft drinks and beverage history here on this y'all show. So hang on, Jerry, take another sip of the Dr. Pepper while you can. When we come back, when we come back on the y'all show, we've got more to say from our Takapola storyteller, Jerry Short. It's talk with a Southern accent and we'll be back right after this. Stay with us. And back we are. It's y'all talk with a Southern accent, John Rawl and Jerry Short, our Taka Polo storyteller. He's with us here for one last segment as we continue to cover all things Southern. He is our Taka Polo storyteller, so he mixes in all the stories of yesteryear with what's going on today. And Jerry, it is fantastic to have you here. You have a home that you purchased a couple of years ago. And here on this program, we've talked about lumber prices going through the roof. We've talked about everything in today, 2021, being so expensive. And one of the things that you and I both and maybe a lot of our audience has discovered that homes have been in the last couple of uh, couple of months almost impossible to find a home on the market. So many people looking with very few houses out there for people to purchase. You have a home that you wouldn't mind selling. I'm understanding some Southern cities, you put a house on the market and then there's ending up a auction essentially to sell the houses. Have you ever seen or heard of anything like what we, what we have going on now? No, because you could always build a chicken coop if that's what you wanted. I mean, you could buy a two by four or a two by six or a two by eight or a one by, but today those prices have gone sky high and, uh, uh, a two before was six, seven dollars, seems like just months ago. And now they'll cost you 11 or 12 or 10. Every now and then you'll catch them on sale. So, uh, you know, they might, uh, these big chains like Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that, they might throw them on sale for nine dollars, eight dollars, eight fifty, if you buy a hundred maybe. But, uh, you could. They say that the pricing is up about 60% plus on lumber alone because I I dealt in uh, some lumber business before. And I know 
of some plants that have been completely closed and uh, they're wood products plants and, and they're putting them back online. People are spending lots of money. I talked to a guy the other day that said he had $30 million he wanted to buy a sawmill in North Mississippi or part of Alabama or South Tennessee even. So, uh, and that's because of the price of this lumber. However, I just don't think it can last. I, you know, the government's getting involved in so much stuff that it's, it's going to be hard for this to keep going like it is. And uh, I, I found myself looking through uh, these PBP loans that the government has given out. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you can you can look at those up on a government site. And, you know, I'm not going to give out all kind of information like that, but you can look at it on a government site. And you can look at any county in any state in the United States, and it will tell you how much money they so-called loaned uh, their customer, if you want to call them that. They loan them so much money for what they lost during this uh, so-called, well, I'm not going to keep so-calling, but during this epidemic. And some of the things will blow you away. Some probably deserve it because the government shut down so many things that some people lost money, not wanting to lose money, wanted to stay open. But they're giving money and big money to people that might just have two lawnmowers and say they got a lawnmower service. They're liable to give them thirty or $40,000. Yeah, I and- just reported on the show last week a Florida couple got a million dollars in loans for the pandemic because they claimed they were farmers and it was a total fraud. They just got sentenced last week. I'm a little surprised that even That's happened quick. so quickly. That is mighty quick. And you're right. And I'm glad you brought that up because I've looked, you know, some like car dealerships and things like this. I've looked say in a 50 mile radius of where I am and I'll know most of these people and I'll know it hadn't affected them. And I'll see where they've got seventy or eighty thousand dollars, and they'll, they'll have it under two or three different names, but it'll be the same place. And it might be logging, it might be farming, it might be trucking, it might be cutting grass, it might be entertainment, it might be anything. And they'll it also give you the information on how many employees they have. So if you're looking for say, let's just say you're looking for a restaurant in town and they liable to have 50 employees. Now they might rotate them in 50. I don't know. They might not work with 10 hours. And it's not like it's costing them money because they've been on all this government uh, uh, unemployment and they, they hiked that stuff up way beyond what you would normally make anyway. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the total figures and the total amount of money and the t- it'll give you all that information It'll give you how many people they've loaned to, and it'll give you the number of loans they've made. It will blow you completely away. And I'm, you know, I'm not knocking it, but I've been around it. I've seen car dealerships almost get millions plus. I've seen other things like that. Churches, churches, churches got churches a lot of money. money. Now they may miss some donations, but why should they? You know, if you're going to tithe, you're going to tithe. But uh, there again, they do get money. I've seen some of those bigger churches getting three and four hundred thousand dollars, and I've seen some maybe not give a sixty, and I've seen some with five employees get uh, not church. Now I'm not completely a broad blank in that, but we may go back to something else. We may go back to a store that just might sell furniture, but they weren't closed, and they may be getting ninety, hundred, ten thousand dollars. And they may say they have 15, 20 employees. And I've never seen over five people at the stores. Hmm. So, uh, you know, there's got to be some things going on that are a little bit shaky. And like you just uh, announced about those people in Florida that they've investigated. And I understand in some of this 50-mile radius that I've kind of went to every county and kind of looked and see who got what from every county. And it's there. If you want to go, you can look it up on a government site. 
You can look it up on uh, on Small Business Association stuff. But uh, you look it up, and you will absolutely, it'll blow your mind. And, uh, you know, the thing, John, that bothers me about it, you know, everybody likes to take stuff if they think they deserve it. And maybe, hey, we got a freebie here. Yeah. But these freebies, they turn into socialism. And then they turn into, if you're taking these freebies, and it's not your your business is not affected, but you're still taking these freebies, and you become a hypocrite, calling yourself a conservative, and you're no more than a liberal, and uh, but you're calling yourself a conservative, and then when you take your money and it goes to the bank, and they directly deposit it, and they call it a loan, I think I've been told that the banks are getting money off of it also. That is a question, Jerry. You bring up banks. I noticed a lot of these loans that you are talking about, the what are they called? P PTP the loans? PTP loans, and they're going through banks. Yeah. How <laughs> how or why are banks or were banks, this is from 2020, what were the banks doing? What was in it for the banks? Look, banks, I've known of bankers that will run people down and have small businesses that they may be self-contractors. Mm-hmm. They'll run them down and tell them, hey, if you'll get your taxes together and you'll get this together, we can get you money. So I don't know why they would be so eager to get. I'm not talking about these like it might be a massive dealership for automobiles or something else of that nature or, or, or nursing homes. Now, I can understand maybe why nursing homes could get some money, but I don't think they're giving them to the employees, even though they always list the number of employees that they have at these places. Uh, you know, and, and, and I'm not throwing stones, and I don't want to be the first person to throw Sounds it. Sounds like you're throwing them. I'm, I'm sorry, Jerry. I'm sorry I got that $20 million loan from the government. Well, I, you know, I'm going to look your county up as soon as I get off here <laughs> and just check that out for sure, and it'll be there in black and white. All right. And uh, your name will appear, and if you put me down as one of your employees, and you got about uh, a million dollars out. I'm looking. Sitting. I'm looking you up right now, everybody. Uh, Jerry, <laughs> you know, don't be casting throwing stones my way unless you can take them coming at you. Listen, I'm gonna stay conservative, and uh, you know, unfortunately, this thing can turn into can turn into socialism quick. The more they keep pouring out like they're doing, and if they keep pouring it out like that, what does it turn into next? What's Karl Marx? Is he not the founder of socialism? It's not capitalism. It's socialism. And then it's communism. And then what's beyond that? So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm rattling on a little bit. Yeah. But I've looked through these things, and I have looked uh, at all these loans in every county. And, hey, it really dang surprises me when I see a guy that makes says he's got a yard service but he'll list that he's got 15 people working for him. And he may have one in every town. But if he does, you move to that another county and you'll see him apply it again and you'll see him accept it again. Mm. Him, it, her, or it, or she, or whatever pronoun you'd like to throw at it. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Yeah, let's be careful on that stuff today. Yeah. Jerry, these websites you referenced, there's several that, track these loans that happened in 2020. And if you're curious, you can search these things by zip code or your area and you can be nosy. And remember, if you got these loans, that's government money. So you're subject to anybody finding out what this, where this was, what it went for, that comes with the turf. And as Jerry says, there's a lot of people got millions and millions and millions of dollars and we're not sure if it was all on the up and up or not. That's why we bring that up here and on today's it is, show. That's fine. But and if it's not, uh, it only leads to something worse. Yeah. And uh, you get to, you know, you you know what what's a, uh, you always take that uh, easy path, right? It no, like, not if you don't have to. No, but I'm talking about search that uh, website and find yeah. out. 
yeah. who took that easy path. Okay. Uh, all right. We'll do it. And uh, for those of us who didn't take the easy path, maybe we can at least be rewarded with a purple cow. That's how we'll wrap hey. this up here. Jerry, thank you very much for coming on here on the Y'all Show. Happy hey, June to you. I, I didn't mean to get off uh, no. there on that, but after I had reviewed those things, they really kind of started sinking home. And why would you accept that if you were a true conservative American, if you did not deserve it? So that's, I'll just end it with that. Or the flip side, if you needed that money or maybe you didn't know about that money, you might want to get a different banker, one that's a little bit more progressive and wanting to get you that money when it's available. Jerry, thank you very much. We'll talk to you again next week, sir. You got it, mister. Hang in there. All right. I was waiting for the title here. I'm, I'm... Hang, hang in there, Mr. Uh, Raw. <laughs> that, that'll work, too. Everybody, our Takapola storyteller, Jerry Short. Well, we have more of the Y'all Show coming up here in the second hour, so stay where you are. We've got it coming up right after this break.